because the nose is trying to find its ideal passage mm. by keeping nasal cycle and all those reflexes in place. And so if I make this, the septum thicker, the mucosa becomes thinner. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. Season 3, face-to-face -face interviews, and we are coming to you from Berlin at the Global Masters IMR His meeting. Uh, and it's such an absolute pleasure for me to, again, have Professor Fazel of Payden on the show. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's a great pleasure to be with you again, Cameron. Very good to be with you. It's quite something to be sitting here. I mean, we've got such a history of meetings and I can clearly remember the first IMR His meeting in Versailles in 2016. Yes. Is when you introduced me to various of the guys who had such another big influence on my career. And eventually the next year we started Saucer. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Well. <clears throat> and now we have eight South Africans at the meeting. Here. Exactly. I have a chance to train many people throughout my life. And I'm happy to be with a lot of passionate people who are eager to learn. And among all those, you're one of the few guys who have the best passion for rhinoplasty. <laughs> yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. And one can one man can make a huge difference. Yeah. You put your country into into focus. We didn't have anybody from South Africa before. Yeah. Every five or ten years, we're having a few guys, but they were coming sometimes, sometimes not seeing, seeing them at all. Yeah. But being from the European Academy side, I'm a guest here. This is the uh, other societies meeting. Yes. So I'm the past president of the European Academy of Facial Plastic Surgery. Yeah. It's a 46 years old society. It yeah, is, yeah. It's no joke. And we have founding leaders. Unfortunately, they passed away. They do not live anymore. But we are the biggest in Europe, so we are so happy to train many young people like yourself in Europe, in our uh, departments and colleagues. No, absolutely not. Our prof since we last spoke, what, two, almost three years ago on the podcast? Yeah. Um, from an EAFPS side of things, I think you're not as involved necessarily, but what's been happening in your life in the last two years? Okay. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm working a lot. I'm a full-time university professor, as you know. Yeah. So I'm working very efficiently in my hometown, in my department, privately too. I accept two fellows each year, one European fellow, one international fellow, and I have residents too. So I'm always on projects. Yeah. And these are sometimes multidisciplinary projects, sometimes my own projects. And it keeps me too much alive. Yeah, yeah. Because when you have younger people around you, they like to be with you because you are the main guy giving them job and they do it and when they publish it wow we're all happy so we are many clinical researchers you're going to hear more and more about those in the coming days and i'm, I'm happy i'm a blessed person because i'm in a unique position to teach and to learn too yeah as i always say the best way to learn is to teach i'm teaching and i'm learning yeah, too. yeah yeah that's what you're on too now you're teaching and you're learning too absolutely but you've also started traveling a little bit surgically wise Yes, uh, I'm traveling, and I've been always traveling to many places, as you know. Yeah. I was making demonstration operations, but more recently I'm doing um, some uh, surgeries, sometimes in Dubai, sometimes in Kuwait. Wow. Eh? Uh, mostly in my hometown, of course, in yeah. Izmir. So, so happy, happy with that. Yeah. It brings excitement. And it's also a challenge, as you know. Yeah. You're also a sportsman, me too. We like challenges. So, challenges in life makes you stronger. Yeah. You learn more. So happy. Awesome. Okay. So the the topic I want to climb into this morning is about the deviated nose. Because the, one of my, you, one you of just my... gave a great, great talk in one of the sessions now. But, you know, cosmetic revisions, something went wrong with the tip, something went wrong with the dorsum or the nose is still skewed. And sit, listening to these guys up there this morning and saying that they don't have perfection, it's actually quite nice to hear because you don't always get perfection. So for the listeners out there, how can you nail a straight nose? Well, this is a billion dollar question. Not a million dollar, <laughs> billion dollar question. Yeah. There's no shortcut answer to yeah. that because, look, in the nose, the key is always the septum. Yes. The septum dictates what the result is going to be. Yes. 
And in recent years, there's a paradigm about preservation of plastic thing. And septum again is the major pillar there in those in the technique too. But today I had a chance to see that some of my colleagues yes. are missing things because we are ENT based, you and I. And from the first days of our residency, we learn how to deal with the nasal septum. Yes. Basically. But the more experienced you are, the more you learn about the anatomy, physiology, and trauma, and other stuff about yes, yes, septum, yes. septum. So, nasal septum, because carrying the nose, it should be straight as much as possible. Unfortunately, starting from birth, we all have trauma in our lives. Yeah. We fall down, and we have small fractures. Those fractures tend to end up with deviated noses in the, in the long term. And when you have it, if it's a complex one, what I tell to my younger people, friends, don't touch the complicated deviated noses. Start with the little ones. What do what with the easier ones? What are they? When the dorsal and the caudal segments are straight, it is much easier to, mm. to correct. But when those two pillars, the dorsal and caudal pillars, are crooked, it's a huge problem. There are two main techniques. One is splitting techniques, the other is removing everything and putting it back. Yes. Removing everything and putting back is not a good idea in my mind. Okay. To, to apply and also uh, to, to, to teach. There are a few guys that they're doing it every day. Okay, understandable, okay. but to me it's, it's overkilling. But I think the indications for that is the key thing for me because if it's like such a severely deviated septum, I, I would, I, I agree with what you're saying, try not to. But if it gets to that point, just do almost like a subtotal. Subtotal is, is a good idea. Yeah. But not taking everything out because uh, with my friends from Germany, I'm not going to, you know, the names already. With the, you know, a small deflection, they were taking everything out. Really? Trying to put it yeah. back. Yeah. It's yeah. overkilling. Yeah, yeah. And most of the yeah. times, no matter how crooked they are, the crooked and the fractured portions are in the, first half, actually first one third of the nose, mm -hmm. as you know. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the part of the nose which is open to trauma is the front part. Yeah. It is around the tip. And those cartilages break easily. Behind them break easily too. But in the 99% of the cases, we can find enough material on the rear part that we can reconstruct the nose. Okay. Okay. So if it's a very severe fracture, you can sacrifice the caudal portion. No problem with that. Part of the dorsal is can be sacrificed too, but not the whole of it. Mm. I don't remember, maybe one or, I can remember one or two cases that I needed to take everything out and put it back. Yeah. One or two cases. I did tons of it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm against overkilling, but we're all surgeons. We're sometimes uh, swipey with our technique and we try to put everything around the technique. Mm. Like if you're a hammer, everything for you nail. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So if you're happy with the so-called so extracorporeal whenever there's division, you tend to go for it. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's a very difficult thing okay. because you demount the whole nose and then you try to put it back in place. Not easy. That is one of the reasons I came up with the abstract graft. It's not me who found the technique, but it's me who popularized the technique. Yes. And as you saw in the morning, it falls perfectly well. Yeah. Because when you touch a neck cartilage, they want it becomes weaker. Yeah. Okay. And when you are a more experienced surgeon, when you start operating revision cases, you see that the subcartage is not strong enough. Yeah. So with this abstract graft, I can add structure and I can also get rid of the crookedness easily. Yes, yes, yes. And in the morning, you saw also some of our friends said the major thing is the etmoid plate. No. Etmoid plate can be. Crooked, fine, but it's easy to overcome that issue. Yes. But the most difficult part is the cartilaginous part. Absolutely. The fractures happen yeah. there. So, to get back to that, again, two techniques, splinting, which I'm in favor of, yeah. because I can do splinting by all means. In more difficult cases, I tell my patients I can go to rip, mm -hmm. take rip, and use it for harvesting and mm -hmm. for uh, supporting too. But, you know, this is the toughest thing. I don't remember any experienced surgeon saying that I solved all my issues with crooked doses. 
it's a trap question for me. I asked the audience, is there anyone in the audience who says that I'm 100% perfect with crooked noses, I have no problem at all? Yeah. Sometimes I catch one or two guys. Really? They raise their hands. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, so you're better than me. Please come here. Yeah. I will be sitting there. Yeah. You speak. Yeah. So there's just a thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, when a septum is crooked, do you normally have a an endonasal approach to try and, or you open up the nose? I, I use both of them. Yeah. Very effectively. It depends what I'm trying to do, actually. Yeah. Externally, it's much easier because you have much wider exposure. But it's not always necessary. Yeah. I'm using the so-called three tunnel or four tunnel technique of mine. It is not the traditional tunnel technique described by Cuttle and his supporters. Mm -hmm. I love using the subdorsal tunnel very much. And then I keep a mucopericondium after that intact, three to five millimeters. And then I can harvest cartilage as much as I like. Okay. Then those tunnels help me to put sperm grafts or yes. unstructured graft yes. easily. Yes, yes. And I can support the caudal septum if I use an unstructured graft. And one or two sutures solve the problem. If you're not going to deal with the dorsum, of course. Yeah. If you're going with the dorsum, it's a bit more complicated, but it can be done endonasally. But if you think life is too short, why take too many hassles? Open it up. It's not <laughs> the end of the day. So you... if you're good in both techniques, yeah. I can do both. So another thing that uh, mention here, it might be really old fashioned. I think it's very old fashioned, but I'm very interested to hear what you say because sometimes I will open up a, a nose that has had previously a septoplasty, but it's still completely deviated. That is scoring of the septum. Okay. So, can you come back to the first question and answer the second one? First of all, open neuroplasty, external neuroplasty makes you help diagnose the problem, especially in these kind of revision cases. Yes. There are times you need to detach the whole mucopericondium to diagnose what the problem is. Yes. So in those cases, opening it widely, dissecting the mucopericondium is a wonderful option. Mm -hmm. So I love it that way. And when you open it up, you see what the problem is. Of course, again, splinting the main issue. Some people say, well, when you splint with l or other splinting things, you can make the nasal septum thicker. Correct. But... It's been a knowledge of 100 years. The septum in Caucasians is two to seven millimeter thickness, changing in different uh, regions. Mm -hmm. So if you make them thicker, it's not the end of the war. People are forgetting one thing, mucosa. Mucosa is the organ of the nose. It is not the other thing, honestly. Mm. So when you make it thin, the mucosa becomes much thicker. Mm -hmm. When you have thicker cartilage, the mucosa becomes narrower. A lot of people forget eh? the, the nasal passages shouldn't be too wide. They shouldn't be too narrow either. Yeah. So if you make it too wide, the tendency becomes the turbulence compensated to make it narrower because the nose is trying to find its ideal passage mm. by keeping nasal cycle and all those reflexes in place. And so if I make this, the septum thicker, the mucosa becomes thinner. Wow. So I, I don't yeah. think anybody talked that, about this before. No, that's very interesting. It's very interesting to think about. Yes. Wow. And that mucosa, as you know, is a tendency to change its width. Yeah. Okay. It can be half a millimeter, one millimeter, two millimeters in thickness. Yeah. 34. When we have any kind of infection, it becomes even four millimeters. Yeah. If you're in nasal plugs, you cannot breathe. Yeah. We use the congestants to get rid of that yeah. congestion. So I will speak about this mucosa thing more and more in the coming meetings. Yeah, yeah. People forget it. Yes, absolutely. They try not to see it. They neglect it as if it is just it's the cartilage and the bone. No. Mucosa is the normal organ of the nose. So last question in the discussion after this morning's lecture. Um, Charles East was talking about when he tries to line the nose up, I'm talking about like the asymmetric faces as well. He doesn't actually think about, or doesn't take into cognizance the lower lip and the mandible. It's interesting for me. Because I think it's something we don't often speak about the deviated noses. They could be deviated the face as well. 
So yeah. what, what, what are some of your thoughts? He, he was right. He was right. The thing is, in asymmetric faces, which yeah. I see a lot in Middle Eastern countries, not too many in my own country, I see asymmetries, but not very severe. The severe ones I see in Middle Eastern countries a lot. Yeah. Most probably because of some inter uh, marital situations, uh, getting married with your cousin, with your cousin's yeah. daughter, and so on. Yeah. Okay. So it can be one of the reasons, or it can be the genetic pool. I don't know how to say because I didn't make any research for that. Anyway, so I always show the patient the pictures. Look, you have an asymmetry. Most of the patients are not aware that they have it. So let's play with your nose now. Let's do the imaging according to glabellar midline. You do it, and then it becomes absurd because it goes out of the way in the midline here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then you say, okay, I'm going to make the correction according to the filtrum in Antonius's spine. You do it, it becomes crooked again. I said, okay, you want to get rid of the crookedness? I say, if you're a Muslim, go to the mosque. If you're a Christian, go to church, start praying. So the God is going to change your face. Okay. Yeah. So I say, if you come here for crookedness, there's no way you can get rid of the crookedness. Yeah. I can help you with the shape. I can help you with the obstruction function, but I cannot change your whole face. You can play with your face like this if it's going to help, <laughs> but it's not an easy thing. Yeah. yeah. So asymmetry of the face is, is very tough. Yeah. Of course, if it's a retrogratia, you can send them to a maxillofacial surgeon yes, yes. that they can play with uh, the upper uh, jaw or maxilla, which is very helpful. Then you postpone nasal surgery at least six months after that. Mm -hmm. It's very helpful. The other thing is, of course, small things like uh, fillers. You can help the patients to get into the symmetry, or you can have additional things around the peripheral aperture. Those things help. Otherwise, yeah. uh, you, we're not gut. Yeah. We're just humble surgeons trying to help our patients, first of all, functionally, then, if we are good, also cosmetically. 100%. Guys, well, there you have it. I mean, it's difficult to get a deviated nose straight, but if you can follow certain guidelines and rules, you should yes. be able to get there. Well, I'm, I'm one of the experts in this field in the world, as you know. I never promise any patient of mine with a crooked nose, I will make it guaranteed 100% yeah. straight. Yeah. I cannot say that. Yeah, yeah. If you find anyone saying that to you, I always tell the patients, leave the room. Yes. They're not honest. Yeah. Because there is no such a thing. Yeah, it's against nature. Yeah. So I think it's very important to be honest with your patient, yeah. with yourself. It is something we are missing in recent years because of this social media thing. Unfortunately, because of this, the, some of the younger colleagues of mine, well, some of my students, are exaggerating or manipulating the truth. Yeah. They're bending the truth, yeah. saying that you go for a surgery, you're not going to have any bruising or no swelling. Yeah, yeah. And day one, you're going to breathe perfectly well. These are not real things. No, I, I think it's so important because it, it is there's a lot of fake stuff out there. So we yeah. So guys, like again, I just want to kind of uh, remind you if you really want you committed to educating yourself better, educate your patients, become a member of these societies. Yeah, FPS is incredible. It's the, the entire gamut of facial plastic surgery, and there's a big meeting in Verona, yes. which is very exciting. September for. fourteen to seventeen yeah. in three big rooms. Uh, the best experts in Europe and in the world will be there. Yeah. And usually we have about 500 members coming from all over Europe, all over Middle East and all over the world. Because in recent years, facial plastics uh, became, we became the center of the whole world in Europe, yeah. facial plastics. Because a lot of good guys are doing great things, a lot of research. So I think it's going to be exciting. Hope to see you there, Cam, as well. Uh, now I'm coming. <laughs> okay. I know, I know, well, and I'm very happy with that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. You're uh, welcome. Great pleasure. Guys, thank you for tuning in and come again next week for another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast. Oh.